Okay, so uh, today we have two topics. Uh, uh, we're going to do um, uh, the topic most relevant to Caridi first, since he has limited time. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, I think, uh, mostly about um, uh, revisiting the topics from uh, last week's discussion, which I just watched. Uh, and then I'll be presenting the work that JF and I have been doing uh, on the um, uh, recessed proposal as we'll be presenting it, which is a very, very nice separation uh, of, um, uh, compared to the previous CEST proposal. So, um, uh, on the, let's see, first of all, uh, Kariti, did you have, um, was there more that you wanted to uh, say before I react to last week's or should I just uh, go ahead and start my reaction to last week's discussion? Um, no, I don't have anything that, that is materially different. Um, there have been uh, a couple of issues with the detached iframe, but those are uh, follow up with vendors uh, that we can also provide some feedback here. Um, things that are sort of uh, affecting a little bit the new system that we use for membranes in detached iframes, but we, we can talk about that later. Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, I, I'm, I'm really, really glad that you've been um, uh, really stressing the membrane mechanism under out of memory attacks. Uh, and I'm very glad that it looks like uh, in current JavaScript, uh, you can actually protect membrane separation in one direction. Um, and what I say in one direction, uh, as I understand it, uh, all of your attacks is to try to prevent the outer realm leaking into the inner realm. Uh, you're not trying to um, uh, so it, it's it's basically it's a it's a one way attack. Uh, you're not trying to prevent the outer membrane the outer realm from attacking the inner realm, um, uh, and uh, trying to get the objects from the inner realm to leak into the outer realm. So I wanted to uh, uh, start out with two points. Uh, one is that this doesn't. Uh, reduce, this doesn't significantly reduce our need for preemptive termination of a, um, some large grain computational unit on out of memory, because uh, the need we have for that is not, uh, is not at all specific to membranes. Membranes are certainly a very, very important special case, but anytime object A calls object B, where object B is going to do something with encapsulated authority that object A is not supposed to have, and object B needs to maintain an invariant. The example I gave in the out of memory talk was just splicing into a doubly linked list. Um, if object A calls object B, object B has an internal data structure that it's maintaining that needs integrity, that, can, that has a doubly linked list in it that object A is not supposed to be able to see or manipulate, uh, object A could strategically bring the system to an all, almost out of memory condition, then call B, causing B to fail to splice the doubly linked list, leaving it an ill-formed state. Uh, and for that, there's no reasonable try catch or try finally strategy that's going to rescue B because uh, you, you can fail at, you know, those things can fail at any time. And uh, if you try to, uh, so you don't even know what failed if you failed. And even if you did know, when you're trying to repair it, you could fail again. Um, so I think in general, uh, uh, out of memory has to, be, you, know, you have to be able to opt into a situation where out of memory causes preemptive termination of, um, uh, of whatever computational unit uh, is necessary to contain all potential corruption. Um, so perhaps the agent, perhaps something smaller, if we can figure out something smaller, 
uh, perhaps the agent cluster even, uh, if we can't contain it at shared array buffers. Um, and and uh, the, uh, 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 Peter uh, from Modable, uh, which, which only has one membrane, so the cross, I'm sorry, only has one realm, only has one realm in the Modable machine. Uh, so in the Modable machine, there is no issue of uh, inter-realm leakage. Nevertheless, when he saw the out-of-memory stuff, he reacted that this is crucial for what they're doing uh, because uh, uh, in a device, when you run out of memory, you can't simply have the device proceed having lost integrity. You want to reboot or something. You want to do something severe. Um, and you want to be able to do that reliably. Um, yep, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I get that. I, I think, uh, yeah, I don't have any, any issue with, with pursuing that. I, I see the separation. Um, one, one comment uh, is a, I'm, I'm not sure that you have think about it, is it like the, the termination also has to work in a way that is, uh, sort of a useful when you have buckles of code or recursive or something like that, because in our case, if that exists and the user opting to it, um, you should be able to do so in a way that they attempt to do some computations that are protected by this syntax most likely. And during that, those computations, they call out someone else from the outer membrane that it, from the outside of the membrane that also protects themselves and such. So it's sort of a, um, a I, I don't see any problem with the membrane just saying our job is to protect against uh, the very particular type of issues. We protect it in a way that we do not uh, um, leak objects but if you want to have termination in your code to protect yourself, you should be able to do so. Okay, good. So I, th I, think, we're, I think we're aligned. Um, also wanted to uh, mention that, uh, let's see, uh, Michael, uh, if, I, if I understood correctly, uh, you're proposing that a deep rewrite uh, that's uh, counting stack depth uh, might provide uh, some help. And so the thing I wanted to point out is that it's not just a out of stack issue, it's also an out of heap issue. Yes, and uh, I feel that I don't have enough information or examples where we can exercise that and see how it goes. Yeah. Um, uh, if you have any concrete example that we can use, that would be great because then we can try to figure out if there's anything missing in what we have. Um, most likely there is because you're not crossing the membrane. You're, I mean, uh, the overflow in that case is just like a overflow of the stack in up in all the functions that you own. So the error will come from the thing that you own because if you are going to access something from the outer membrane, then you're going through the membrane and the membrane protects against overflows on the other side. So well, I feel so, that it might work. I, I need examples. Okay, so so I mean, here's here's a sh the shape of an example, not a concrete example, but the shape of an example that shows uh, how little the membrane robustness by itself helps. Uh, which is, uh, let's say that the you know the outer realm is the trusted so you know is, is functioning as the trusted system code, and the inner realm is the untrusted code, which is the assumption you're engineering for. Uh, and let's say that the, um, the inner realm knows that after it returns to the outer realm, the outer realm is going to do some operation within the outer realm uh, that is going to allocate memory as part of that operation. Uh, so the uh, inner realm uh, allocates heap until it's almost exhausted uh, and, it, you know, and, and how it knows how much heap to allocate is of course sufficiently tricky that it's, that it's, almost, it's really 
hard to write anything like a reliable test for this. But remember that a test has to be reliable an attack only has to work occasionally. Um, so in any case, so the inner realm allocates until it's almost out of heap. It returns to the outer realm. And then the outer realm manipulates its own internal data structures, um, but where a out of heap error during a crucial part of the outer realm's internal algorithms causes it to lose integrity in a way that the attack code anticipated uh, such that the attack code can now exploit the particular form of integrity loss that it uh, induced in the outer realm. Uh, uh, I, I think that there's no way to protect against that other than uh, to really create a reliable uh, um, uh, opt in to a preemptive termination. So, um... So the, the, in the case of uh, overflow in the memory there, once the inner realm calls out something that costs the outer realm, that is its uh, so, uh, is, is everybody else able to hold, 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 hold on, hold on, Kriti? Kriti, your audio is breaking up terribly uh, as far as I can hear. Did, did other people hear Caridi okay? No, it broke up. Uh, no, it's, yeah, it's where I am right now. The connection is terrible here. Okay, um, uh, let's see. Um, see if I can move it to a better place and like get a little bit better connection. Okay, okay. More... Mark, um, I would suggest taking a moment to pause and and uh, help Dan get, Dan get up to speed. It seems like he's a little bit uh, behind behind the cycle. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, Dan, uh, have you? Uh, I'm responding to the uh, conversation from last week, which I was not there last week, but I just watched the video. Uh, and uh, the particular part that we're discussing right now is uh, the attacks uh, due to various out of memory conditions. Uh, being able to be induced by allocating almost to out of memory. Uh, um, uh, and then the fact that a out of memory error is not necessarily uh, fatal means that things can continue to, to execute uh, after uh, some algorithm has lost integrity because it, it ran out, it, it hit an out of memory error at some, at some uh, point it was not prepared for. So, uh, uh, Karidi last week was uh, uh, explained the um, uh, work they've been doing on trying to create a membrane such that for sp specifically for the membrane separation between an outer trusted realm and an inner untrusted realm. So just one way suspicion, not mutual suspicion. Uh, they uh, um, uh, were able to uh, enhance the membrane mechanism so that the inner realm uh, could not uh, compromise membrane separation through out of memory, through all, specifically through out of stack, um, could not compromise the membrane separation in order for the inner realm to obtain direct access to an object from the outer realm. Uh, and I think what they were explaining would probably work for out of heap as well. Uh, but I was um, explaining that uh, you know, it's wonderful to be able to solve it for membranes, and it's wonderful if the membrane special case can be solved on current JavaScript. But uh, altogether, uh, we have the, you know, the membranes are only one special case. The ability to corrupt um, uh, uh, other code and other data structures by out of memory is a pervasive danger, and I, I think that there's no realistic protection against that. Uh, without uh, some new mechanism like opting into preemptive termination, which is what I've been proposing. Right. So I think uh, so. What I'm trying to explain is that the protection that we offer is for leaking objects from the outer realm, 
And that's the, that's the key part of it. And when you allocate the memory inside the inner realm, and then you go and cross the membrane. I'm, I'm, I'm some sorry, sir. Hold, hold on, other audio problem. Whoever has kids in the background, please mute. Uh, that's me as well. Uh, a lot of noise okay. here. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, so you you should not mute. <laughs> okay, so go on. <laughs> okay, let me. Um, yeah, let me. Hold on. Okay. So in that second um, where there's no audio, um, could I? Um, um, urge everyone to try to find a good visual bit to have a screen shared when they're talking. I think it does help uh, to keep people on track sometimes. Um, hopefully, I don't know if I'm disconnected or if Kariti just has his audio muted. I think it is, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm, I'm muted. I'm waiting for you to finish. Um, um, I don't have anything to share or an example will be a little bit more tricky. But the, the point is, the point I'm trying to make is that heat overflow and stack overflow are pretty much the same from the membrane point of view. You are doing operations in the, in the inner realm. Then you call something on the outer realm that costs the overflow to happen. And you are protecting against leaking the object reference from the outer realm. That's the protection that we have in place right now, which means that the minute you cross the, the, the membrane, there is protection there. It try catch basically, basically. Um, and the proper protection in terms of identity. So if the error occurred on the outer realm, you're going to get an error that belongs to the inner realm and it's not going to be leaking the identity that give you access to things that you should not have access to. Of course, the integrity of that part of the program and the memory and how you eventually go and access some data out of it, you still go through the membrane, so we don't protect against the integrity, but we pre prevent leaking objects that you, don't, that you don't have access to. Okay, so I, I buy that. that. That all makes sense to me. So we should expect the membrane protects against both kinds of out of memory. Um, uh, and, but that that the general attack of out of memory causing corruption and potentially exploitable corruption still needs new mechanism. Um, and uh, in particular, um, uh, modable being a case where there's only one realm and therefore there's no danger of inter-realm leakage uh, still has this danger and still needs a new mechanism. Um, the Okay, the other thing is that uh, you explained, if, if, okay, so if I understand the sort of core solution for um, uh, protecting the outer realm from the inner realm uh, in, in terms of a one-way suspicion relationship, it was to actually construct the membrane in the inner realm, is that correct? Yes, co co construct a, a part of the membrane inside the inner realm, the part okay. that uh, creates the proxies that represent things from the outside world, while the other part that represents the proxies from the inner realm for the outer realm, that one's still in the, in the outer realm itself. Oh. And then okay. having a broker in between, which is just a registry of heat maps. Okay, great, great. I was, I was about to suggest exactly that because I didn't gather that from last week. So, um, so basically there's a, if, let's call the two sides. So in, in a system where you have mutual mistrust, you know, where Alice is creating a membrane between Bob and Carol. So neither Bob nor Carol trust each other, but Alice's membrane should protect both of them from each other. The thing that you've done is, is a mechanism uh, in that the uh, Bob side of the membrane would actually be created out of proxies uh, and target and shadow target objects from Bob's realm and the side of the membrane exposed to Carol's realm would actually be constructed out of 
uh, proxy and shadow target objects from Carol's realm. Is that correct? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. And the communication between these two pieces that is also created by Alice is just a, a, a record of WIC maps that they can share between the two of them so they can do lookups and identity preserving operations. But it's just a, a registry. There's no code running on Alice itself. Uh, Alice is just creating that, that record. Okay, great. And the handlers, uh, the handlers of the, Bo the Bob Realm proxies would be handlers also created from Bob Realm objects? Yes, everything. Okay. Uh, the, the shadow target, the, the handler, the traps, everything must be on the same realm that uh, uh, is, uh, is, is sort of containing the, the operations, yeah. Okay, and it's the handler that, it's the, ha it's the handler code that, uh, that has captured the pointer to the object from the other realm because it, it then has to do the, um, the reflect operations in order to uh, turn these into oper the, the, the cross realm operations, right? It's, it's, it's the handler that has, has to actually operate on the foreign object, is that correct? Yes, let me share, let me share, I think, uh, let me share here quickly the operation that are really important to understand here, just for the sake of everyone uh, understand this. Uh, this is on, uh, this is, this is the code that runs inside secure value is the code that creates the proxies inside the inner realm. And when you are about to call something from the outside, uh, this is the applied trap on the proxy. So you get a, you create a proxy of a function that is in the outer realm, and you're going to call it right now. When you're going to call it, you're going to call it using the reflect.apply from the outer realm with the target that belongs to the outer realm, with the argument list and the this value from the, arg from the outer realm. So the operation itself, and this is the one that protects against the overflow. So okay. Try so, catching so, uh, the operation. Uh, okay. So so there's there's um, I'm not understanding the conventions needed to read this code. Um, which of of the variables here, which one is holding a value, which is an object from the same realm as the code that's running, and which ones are holding a value that's from the um, that's from the foreign realm. So the only object that is from the outer realm here is this target. This is the real target uh, that represent okay. that is being represented by the shadow target. Okay. So this target belongs to the outer realm. That's why we call it raw. Everything that is raw here belongs to the outer realm. Uh, you're storing. I see the the const open curly target colon raw target close curly equal this i mean that whole line 362 the this is the handler object because this is yeah a, yeah yeah we use the handler object to store the original target and the shadow target comes as an argument okay so um you're storing it as a public property on the handler i mean i understand the handler is encapsulated so it's actually safe but it's uh you could have i mean if you yeah, I could use the weak map there to not even add it there because this is this object is your right. This object belongs to the sandbox, and I have a direct link to something from the outside here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So raw target, um, raw target as raw function. The as is TypeScript rather than JavaScript, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so if I just mentally erase all of the TypeScript and just think in JavaScript, uh, there's no, uh, uh, I'm still reading the, the JavaScript, the, I'm still reading the runtime execution semantics accurately. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay.
and uh, just for you the raw environment is the is the the broker between the two sides of the membrane that's the one that allow me to get reference to object from the outside realm okay Okay, um, uh, and raw apply hook, that's a function from this realm, correct? Uh, this, this is a function from the outer realm. This is reflect or apply from the outer realm. It's reflect or apply from the, oh, 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 interesting. And the reason for that one, uh, even though not necessarily, um, initially, we were using reflect or apply from this realm because you're just asking the engine to call a function road target with these arguments. Yeah. Reason this line is this detach iframe. Um, in a detach iframe in Chrome, when you are uh, following some code there, uh, they do some extra checks to see if the callback that you're calling is from a detached iframe and then they throw some error. Uh, so the solution that we found was, uh, well, not even the execution of the reflect that applied or reflect or construct should be from the inner realm. Instead, they should be from the outer realm because we're calling things from the outer realm. Okay, so do, is, is the convention here that raw um, uh, every variable that's holding something from a foreign realm uh, 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 is uh, held by a variable named raw, and raw only holds such variable. Yeah, yeah. That, that that it's an if and only if. That okay, great. Uh, yeah, this is this looks. Yeah. Good. So in this code, every time that we interact with raw, we have to do try catch because we don't know what's going to happen there on the outer realm. Might be stack overflow, might be heap overflow. You could be just a throw an error and we need to protect against that so we can recreate error when needed for the inner realm. Okay. And what realm is raw env in? Uh, is on the outer realm because remember we don't have with this thing we don't have a communication between two uh uh inner realms we have the outer realm sort of a root realm let's call it root realm for now which is the marshal if you need two uh, sandboxes you create two of them and they don't communicate with each other they always go through the marshal so if this code is symmetric, couldn't you, uh, couldn't Alice create both uh, realms, Bob and Carol, and just put a membrane directly between them that does not go back through? Yeah, you, you could do that with this, with this, uh, with this kind of uh, membrane, yes. Okay, great. We just don't do it because we want to have the Marshall in place. Okay, uh, good. So uh, that was everything I had to say about the membrane uh, the out of memory topic. Uh, the other, uh, so, so if there's, if there's more, more you wanna say on this topic, uh, let's do that before I change topics. No. Okay. Uh, so the other one was uh, the issue of um, uh, whether the Realm API should create an isolated Realm or a, um, uh, a realm that's attached to all of the host specific behavior. Uh, and, uh, and also the question of what the hook should be. And the, I think there was um, an implicit understanding of a particular constraint on the design that's important to me, but I but it wasn't said explicitly. So I, just, I wanna say it explicitly and see if it's consistent with what we talked about, um, which is it's not just the case that we want to separate 
the new realm from the actual host. It's that we want to create an arbitrarily different virtual host and have the code in the new realm see the virtual host that we've created using the hooks and using JavaScript code um, to just see that as the host. So just to, to very concrete, um, if I'm I want using the Realm API, I want to be able to, let's say on Node, uh, create an emulated browser host and then load code into the emulated browser uh, such that the code loaded into the emulated browser can't tell that it's not on a genuine browser. Uh, that would be the ideal. And that's what I'm calling preserve host. You know, that's the goal that I, that I touched on last time that I'll be presenting this time, preserve host virtualizability. Uh, to put it another way, allow JavaScript code to act as host to other JavaScript code. Yes, I think that that's still the goal. Okay, uh, so with that as the goal, uh, there's um, a particular question that came up that has a uh, interesting answer in terms of that goal, which is if whatever way there is of spawning a realm such that the new realm is implicitly tied to, uh, to its host, if within such a realm, um, you know, with, let's say within the virtual browser realm that's created through the Realm API on Node, if within that it does uh, a new Realm construction where it's using whatever the, the parameters are, whatever the, you know, whatever the way of creating it is, such that the new Realm is supposed to be connected to the same host as the creating Realm, uh, in this case, it would be the emulated host. So the, the, um, the emulation, the, the having the realm, having let's say the realm constructor be able to create a new realm that reuses the host of the, that realm constructor object itself, uh, that has to preserve the virtualization. In other words, if, if browser code running on node within a virtual browser uh, does a new realm uh, saying, you know, new realm connected to my host implicitly, then the host it's connected to implicitly should be the virtual browser, not node. Yes. So that's when, when I think we touch on what happened when we have nested realms and uh, one of the realms in the way up attempts to be, or is detached, what happened with the other ones? And I, I, and I feel that what you're saying is, if the one that is detached is emulating uh, the host uh, operations, uh, then the, the, the inner realms or the realms that were created out of it should not be affected. They should not even be um, uh, signaling that they are detached already. And the detach is really a, an operation that uh, is more of an operation that is not observable because you don't know if the host uh, operations are being, or the host hook are being implemented by the outer realm. And if they are, they should be the ones handling the, the host uh, communication. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I think so. Let me go back over it again in my own words to see if we're saying the same thing. Um, uh, uh, normal realm a running on node, so so uh, realm A that is uh, that sees as its host node with no illusion uh, creates realm B uh, and detaches it, 
there's also, by the way, the fact that it creates it first and then detaches it creates some temporal issues that I'm very confused about that we'll need to come back to. But, let, but to avoid the temporal issues, uh, let's say that we just have two operations, create attached realm and create detached realm. Um, so realm A does a create detached realm, uh, which creates realm B and create detached realm. It provides all of the hooks to the create de detached realm operation so that code provided by realm A can act as a virtual browser to code running in realm B. So uh, code, so the realm B code is what you refer to as detached. It's completely isolated from the, um, from the node host, uh, but it's host operations are being intercepted and act according to the hooks provided by the code running in realm A. Uh, okay, now realm B now creates an attached realm, C. So C is A's grandchild. Since it's creating an attached realm, what it's attached to is whatever the behavior is of the hooks that A provided to emulate the, the, the host of B. So the emulated host of B is also the emulated host of C since that's what C is attached to. Let me, let me flip the table here. Um, so it was my assumption, and it might be wrong, it was my assumption that the evaluator was going to provide the proper hooks for all these operations that you want to control, saying that if you create a realm uh, and inside that realm, you create an evaluator. And when you are evaluating code inside that evaluator, if the code attempts to create another realm, uh, the, the host operations are going to be the host operations provided by the evaluator. Okay. Uh, so and it, it was not, so, a, it, it was, go ahead. Yeah, so it might be the case that we can move all of the hooks of interest to the evaluator, in which case the simple d dichotomy of attached versus detached doesn't have to get wrapped up in discussion of hooks. Uh, that would be right, wonderful. Right. That, would that, be that wonderful. was that was my assumption. That was my okay. assumption initially. Okay. okay. So uh, because I, I, at, at the end of the day, in that particular case, we don't know yet what, I mean, I don't have a clear picture yet of how a realm would be tied up to the host operations because those are I describe it in the spec today, but they are dispersed in different places and such. If we, and because we don't have an evaluator, it's more difficult for me to get around my, my, my head around these concepts. So I will, I, 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 I will assume that once the evaluator comes in, the evaluator can define uh, or centralize the access to the host operations because we want to hook them. And at that point, we can say, hey, well, when as a result of an operate, a, a evaluation there, any realm constructed by that should be tied up to these operations as the host operation for that code that is being evaluated there. And in that case, then, as you said, yes, you, you create a realm and you detach it. What you're really doing is detaching it from the evaluator that uh, allows you to create that thing. So, uh, so I'm hopeful that that might turn out to be the case. Uh, and I don't have off the top of my head any host hooks that have to be at the realm level rather than the evaluator level. Uh, so if that turns out to be the case, then the simple story works and that's great. Uh, just, just, but in order to just make my point in case it doesn't work, let me take a, an example of a hook 
that would naturally be at the realm level, but if we decide not to provide it at the realm level, it's an easy thing to work around. So this is not a compelling example, it's just an illustrative example, which is date.now. Now is provided by a primordial. A primordial evaluator, it's per realm. Uh, so, uh, there, you know, so obviously you can create a realm and then go ahead and monkey patch date.now and the date constructor to be whatever the hell you want, which is why it's not a compelling example. But let's say that rather than creating the primordials and then monkey patching before you allow it to be used, that you simply uh, wanted to provide a current time hook because you know, the semantics of date.now is that it calls a host function to, um, to obtain the current time. So uh, that's an example of something where if you, if you create a detached realm, the detached realm should not have access to the current time according to the real host. Uh, so the, the code in A that's creating detached realm B might use the realm API to provide a current time hook. That let's say the, it says date.now is always five. Um, if, uh, so then the, the new set of primordials for realm B would have um, uh, you know, its date constructor and its date.now function would always say the current time is five. Uh, if inside realm B, it creates an attached realm C, so that, it, so that C inherits all of B's host behavior, B's current time host behavior is five, so C would implicitly get five as the, you know, whenever, whenever code inside C asks what the current time is, it would get five because realm C being attached has inherited host behavior from B. Mm. Okay, I, I didn't quite get all that. Uh, one notice about data now is that to date, data now is not a is not going through a host specific hook. Um, in fact, a detached iframe, for example, if you do data now on a detached iframe, uh, you get the you get the the timestamp. Uh, you get what timestamp? Uh, the, the, the time stand the same if, if you were attached. There's no difference between what you get there. Okay, so that's just a bug. That's a bug we need to fix. Um, right, because I feel that the spec is not taking into consideration that those operations should be, are, are in fact IO, and theref therefore they should go through the host. Right. That's right. not the only one, there might be a lot, a lot more, even in 4, 402, we say, well, when you're trying to get the default locale or something like that. Exactly. Um, uh, so yeah. I haven't tested the, the default locale, um, but yeah. I, I will test it, what happened with the detached iframe, uh, mm -hmm. but it will be interesting to, yeah. to, to see so, what happened there. Yeah, I'm not claiming that any of this uh, corresponds to current detached iframe behavior. I'm concerned with what it is that we specify. Um, uh, and then, you know, the, a shim can, a shim implementable today can, can deviate from what we specify in ways that we document. Uh, that's always been the case with shims. It's okay to specify something that doesn't precisely correspond to what we can shim today. Um, also, the date.now thing, well, as I mentioned, you can always do it with monkey patching. So it's no more than an illustrative example. Uh, but um, uh, but one, I mean, so one of the things that we really do need to do as part of getting all this right is to identify all of the host hooks and make it explicit that these are host hooks. And then to make sure that anything that's a host hook 
can be trapped somewhere. And trapping it, uh, you know, to the degree to which we can trap it in the evaluator rather than trapping it in the realm, that's great. Um, No, but but I I I I think I understand. Uh, I at least the what I'm getting the sense that I'm getting is that if we do match on the realm and we specify that, along with that, we should specify all the different things that we would like to automatically be uh, uh, or or uh, all the things that are. Uh, Post driven that the detached action should in fact put in place or guarantee. Mm -hmm. Because if we go and say, let's do the round first, we get this working, we get the detach, and at that point, after detaching the, the, the realm, you still can do what they do now, uh, it's going to be a little bit weird. And, and in order for you to really um, do something about it via the evaluator, you will have to know the state or the current state can, of that realm. You know. Yeah, date, the evaluator cannot fix date.now, uh, but we can still fix date.now by monkey patching the new realm before we allow code to execute it because it's date.now is a property of a primordial. It's not a property of the evaluator. Right, what, what I'm trying to say is that I, uh, at least that's what I'm understanding what you're saying is that we want to make sure that the detached action on a realm has the right consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. Uh, because eventually once the evaluator comes, the evaluator will not have to do uh, gymnastics to guarantee that a detached iframe does not have access to data now or something like that. I would yes. want to do it now so when the evaluator comes it's easier for the evaluator to be introduced yes so we need to not only make sure that it's that it's detached from all host uh, uh, operations but that javascript code can provide those operations instead as virtual host operations such that the such that if that realm creates a new attached realm, uh, the, the B creating C in my scenario, that the inheriting of host operations in that case is inheriting the virtual host operations. Okay. Yep, I'm fine with that. Okay, great. So you don't have any objections on the creation of the realm being a single creation that you could opt out by calling detach after the creation. Well, it's good. So that's the temporal issue. That's why I said I want to put the temporal issue aside at first. Uh, uh, and that's uh, by imagining that we just had two atomic operations as alternatives: create attached realm and create detached realm. Uh, if you, if creating a new realm always creates it, creates it attached, and then you detach it, uh, then uh, you have all sorts, then it's not clear, then, then I'm very confused about how that would work uh, because that means that code could have executed in the child realm while it was still attached and then continues executing after it becomes detached and the host has been changed to the virtual host. Um, and in particular, let's well, say well, that I, I feel that, so I feel that that's the, the key point that you just mentioned, like, like the, the creation of the realm does not imply, so uh, let me, let me change that. The realm cannot be changed to use the hooks after, after the, uh, after his creation. I've, I, I think as the whole the realm is created, and at the time of the creation, we resolve what the host operations are. What are the hooks for it from the current uh, execution environment? And the only thing that you can do is detach from that. And if you detach from that, 
Well, none of these operations will work. They will throw errors. Uh, I, I'm completely confused. Um, it uh -huh. sounds, uh, did, uh, the, if you're providing the hooks, post, so it's when you provide the hooks that you should be detached from the outer realm. I'm sorry, det you detach from the, from the original host, right? If you're, if you're providing hooks that emulate a browser, you want it to be detached from the node host. Yeah, let me, let me, uh, let me try to clarify. What I'm saying is that the, there are no hooks in the realm. When you create a realm, you create a realm that is automatically associated to the current environment uh, available hooks. And uh, whether or not you detach that iframe, detach operations is just simply disconnecting from those and just uh, start giving error for any operations that you do inside that realm. Um, if, you, if you attempt to call any API that needs the hook, the, the hook from the host and it will just simply throw an error. Um, so that's the initial step. The, okay. if, if you want to take control of the hooks for a new newly created realm, you will have to compose the evaluator and during the execution inside the evaluator, you create a realm. And that's where the new realm that you're creating is going to be bound to the host operations virtualized by the evaluator. So this is a composition API. So if, uh, you use them, if you compose and then you have control over the hooks, if you just create a ROM out of the blue, you're going to get whatever host operations you have at the current environment that is creating the ROM. The I think we're still working on two different conceptual models. Uh, I think you're, you're saying that you want to move all the hooks in, all the ability to hook into the evaluator API, even if yes. the functionality that you're hooking is not about evaluation, but it's functionality like date.now that is realm wide. Yes. Okay, that does but not make we, sense to me. So, they, so many, th many things that we need to hook are per evaluation or per evaluator in a natural way. But the things like date.now that are naturally about the realm and not about evaluation in the realm, uh, I think should be hooked at the realm level, not at the evaluator level. So you, does that mean that then if I detach the realm, I should still be able to get data now? You should still be able to get date dot now, but the date dot now is not calling the original host, it's calling the hook. So when you create a detached realm, you provide JavaScript code, you provide the hook code for emulating the host of the detached realm. Is that um, I'm trying to I'm trying to cope with what you just said about the about the fact that they do not belong to the evaluator because uh, I see the evaluator not necessarily as an evaluator itself but as a host control mechanism and for any IO operations that you will carry on, um, you have the, the level of control there that allow you to virtualize that operation. And data now for me, is just an IO operation. And uh, I don't see a difference between data now uh, or any other thing that we feel that belongs to the evaluator today. Can you, can you elaborate more on why do you yeah. think that this, yeah. this is you've different? Got you've got multiple evaluators operating with, this, with, with a shared set of primordials. 
so the the behavior of the primordials cannot depend on which evaluator the 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 evaluate the the code that called the primordial was evaluating in right the the and i don't want to have to create two realms just in order to get one virtual realm um I want to just can, be able to. Can I raise, a, can I raise a point of order here that uh, we're halfway through the meeting and um, okay. Dan Connolly is in attendance and wanted to work on the SES stuff? Okay. Um, uh, Karidi, um, uh, do have we gotten to a point where we understand what we're disagreeing about? I think so. Okay, good. Good. So I'm going to. Um, so it, it's so. Um, so yeah, it's. Um, uh, there's a lot I, I want to say on the other topic. So if this is a good settling point, I propose we switch to the other topic. Yep. Good for me. Okay. Good. And we'll start by presenting. Okay, so can everybody see a um, uh, a GitHub page? Yep. Okay. This is the README for um, the draft compartments API that uh, JF and I have been working on. Um, so um, uh, the um, Mark, before you start, can you share the link in the chat so we can? Oh yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Locally. Good idea. Okay, I just shared the link, I think. Can people see the link? Yeah. Okay. And is the text in the window large enough for everybody to read comfortably? Yeah, works for me. Okay, great. So, uh, so the, the the core idea here is that uh, of the um, we started off with a large. Uh, proposal called CES that included the realms proposal and was uh, leveraging the realms proposal to build uh, a CES system. Then we separated realms and CES such that CES was no longer layered on top of realms, but they were side by side. Uh, and that's, that has to do with, you know, the, the separation we were just hearing between realm and evaluator. Uh, so that everything that CES is concerned with does not assume that there are multiple realms. Um, uh, and, uh, and now we're making a, we're proposing to make a further separation uh, of that into two proposals uh, uh, because we noticed a very clear separation that's very much thanks to the work of Modable and TC53 which is uh, what uh, Modable has built as you know, one of their configuration options, but the important configuration option uh, from our perspective, uh, and the one that corresponds to the base machine for the TC53 standards work is a single realm 
SAS environment that by default has no runtime evaluators that, that is consistent with all JavaScript code, um, all let's say all JavaScript module code uh, getting uh, compiled and loaded uh, ahead of time at initialization time uh, such that uh, the thing that's running on the device um, does not necessarily have the ability to accept new JavaScript module source code at runtime that was not already known about at start time. Uh, so uh, it also doesn't need to build, to have the APIs for building a CES environment out of a non cess environment. Uh, and therefore, for example, uh, if it does provide for runtime evaluation, which I'll get to in a moment, of uh, that it doesn't need to accommodate sloppy mode because the sloppy mode simply doesn't exist in a, in a, in a CES machine. Um, so there's a whole lot of complexity that we leave aside if we focus on, on, the, on the side of this where we're just focusing on uh, the standalone CES machine. Uh, so um, I should also uh, uh, find and paste the URL for the standalone CES proposal, um, which is what Modable started from. Uh, hold on, let me get that. Walmart's taking that up. I just want to make a, a comment for the video. Um, it would be a good idea for us to have a, uh, a diagram somewhere of how each of these specifications, including the um, addition of proxy and weak map to the ECMAScript standard, relate to each other. Um, like what dependencies there are, or for that matter, what concurrent, how they might be related to each other. I'm just saying, if someone could take, say, an hour to draw up a diagram for that, that would be helpful. Did anybody uh, catch what I said? Uh, I did. I, I agree. Um, uh, I think it would be extremely helpful. Uh, I'm still navigating to find the standalone CES implementation documents. Why is this so hard to find? Just looking at it. Okay, hold on. Yeah, knowing which uh, proposals are still active and which ones have kind of been retired in favor of others would be a nice part for that diagram. Okay, I have found it. So just, uh, just from my end, I'm not sure if anybody else has seen that. Um, your browser content rendering is stuck. But the address bar is changing. So uh, I, I, I was actually purposely not searching for it in the in the window that I'm presenting. So not to bother everybody with my searches, but I just pasted into the chat the um, the draft spec for standalone CES, uh, which I've also now switched put into a new tab and switch the window to. So does everybody see the draft spec for standalone CES? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm going to switch back to the first tab to talk about the new work that the, the standalone CES document is um, uh, really or uh, 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 really quite orthogonal to the new work that we've done in, in this new document. And the standalone suspect has been stable for a long time. Uh, so uh, what, it's, uh, what it's really about is um, sort of what is the 
you know, the safe, the, the, you know, the OCAP safe JavaScript in terms of the, um, the uh, reduced behavior of the primordial. So all, you know, all the primordial, all the shared primordials are frozen. Uh, the the um, uh, uh, function dot prototype dot constructor points at a function that always throws and likewise for all of the other function constructors that are reachable by navigation. So things like that, date.now acts like the date is always NAN, just all of those kinds of things. Uh, so just, um, uh, but then on top of that, uh, we've been um, uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, how do you create um, new, mo oh, I'm sorry, and, and the, the issue of separate evaluation is one that we that uh, where we've understood the semantics for a while and what we want because we've had the evaluator built on the eight magic lines of code uh, but with what we've been dealing with and what many of the meetings uh, here uh, have been about is uh, trying to con control module loading and linkage in CES uh, in order to support in order to provide good support for least authority linkage. Uh, and that's what TC53 needs, that's what Monable needs, that's what we need, and, and certainly everybody building on uh, CES within a full JavaScript, uh, like uh, MetaMask in the browser and like Node, uh, what, what they need as well. Um, so we realized that we can really divide it all into two phases. Uh, which is how do you build a CES system out of a JavaScript system versus uh, what does a CES system look like once you've entered into it, whether it was whether you started with a JavaScript system or whether you just started up on a CES machine. Um, so uh, so uh, we're now dealing with just the second in the proposal labeled CES and we'll take all the creation issues and put it into a separate proposal. And the big simplifying assumption for the CES machine uh, is that um, uh, it only has to deal with modules whose names and source codes were known about uh, um, uh, at, at the time that that the that the CES, that this CES machine started, that the CES machine starts with some kind of out of band configuration uh, that uh, gives it the the full set of initial module source codes. Um, so, and then what we want to be want to do at runtime, the source code of course doesn't have any authority. Uh, what we want to do at runtime is control the uh, initial the the instantiation of those loaded of those static modules control their control their instantiation control the scope that they're in um, control how they're wired together and control how uh, whatever the initial authorities are from the host allow the startup code to also subdivide attenuate and hand out those initial authorities uh, see a question from uh, Dan Connolly. Initial module source code. Source code is invisible in this API. Is it? That's correct. It's not visible. Um, uh, so the idea is that uh, the initial, the the start code, whatever code execution starts at. Let's just call that main that the main uh, starts in an environment uh, in which its import namespace includes all modules of concern. Uh, and therefore, uh, when it creates other compartments, it can um, create the other compartments by mapping their import namespace into its own import namespace. 
Uh, and by controlling that mapping, it can do arbitrary rewiring of uh, how those compartments see, how modules in those compartments see each other. Um, uh, uh, so that's what's, so that's the idea here. Okay, so, so I think at this point, jumping directly into the API uh, that's in front of us and explaining it is the thing to do. So yeah, there's- uh, Mark, I have some clarification questions. Um, yes. So if you have the out of band configuration as something that is, seems to be important here, mm -hmm. uh, does that out of band configuration is extracted from the source code during that process of extracting that information? Um, do you apply, do you foresee people applying some sort of validation in a way that the linkage aspect of it doesn't have to be validated at, at the wrong time? I, I understand the question. It's a very good question. Uh, because it's already I think the answer needs to be no. Uh, but obviously people can provide their own separate validation. But the reason I think the answer needs to be no is that uh, if module foo has in it the declaration import bar, that there's no necessary static knowledge of what, what module that's actually supposed to be importing uh, because that's I see. So you're saying dyna dynamic import is going to break that because they can do whatever import they want. Right. It's, it's up to, so the compartment API, the API I'm about to explain is intended to give uh, the code, uh, the runtime code within this proposal, you know, the runtime code running on the SES machine, uh, complete control over the import, the import namespaces and the wiring together of modules through import namespaces. So if foo says it imports bar, it should be up to code using this API to determine at runtime what it actually imports. Okay. Okay. So the, uh, so the compart so there's a compartment constructor that's sort of the new API added to the standalone um, uh, SES spec uh, document that's in the other tab. Uh, the compartment API uh, new saying new compartment creates a new compartment instance. Uh, the new compartment instance has a new global object. Uh, the new global object is populated with exactly three uh, per compartment initial objects, uh, which we can refer to as evaluators, um, uh, and, uh, which is the eval function, uh, the function constructor, and a new compartment constructor. So this was the, the, um, you know, the big aha from Modable's previous work is that saying new compartment is all, you're, you're always providing, there's a parent-child relationship between the compartment uh, that's, you know, the creating compartment and the created compartment. And we don't want to do that according to who called new constructor, rather we do it by which compartment constructor they did new on. So every time you create a new compartment, it gets its own compartment constructor. And then um, new, compart new compartment using that compartment constructor creates a compartment that's a child of the compartment that the compartment constructor came from. Um, compartment constructor uh, takes, uh, go ahead. Another clarification. So does this relationship also works across realms that you create inside that compartment? 
so uh, uh, so we have not, I think that that's an important question because this all needs to be consistent with the multi-realm world. So we have to have an answer to that question. Uh, uh, and the reason that uh, I hadn't thought about that question uh, previously is that we're now um, uh, focusing on the uh, TC53 scenario and the moddable scenario where, there, where there's only one realm. Um, but let, let me think okay. it through right, let me, let me think it through right now because it, it, it should be the case that the constraints give us exactly one answer. Uh, um, so, uh, so ask me the question again. So if I create a compartment uh, and uh, I evaluate code inside that compartment that um, attempts to create a new compartment, you're saying that they are re related. There is a child, parent-child relationship and the constructor of the compartment that I get inside the evaluation, the, the source that is being evaluated is something provided by this compartment or by, by the internals of this compartment. And the question is, what happened if, as part of the uh, source that I'm evaluating, I create a new realm and in that new realm, uh, in the default evaluator of that realm, I try to create a new compartment. Okay, so there's uh, two choices. Uh, one choice is that um, uh, in a multi-realm world that we add a realm constructor uh, to each compartment global in, in the same way that we add a compartment constructor. So there's always, so that realm construction is always relative to a parent compartment. That's one choice. Uh, the other choice, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is what I kind of been assuming is that uh, the realm constructor is part of the shared primordial set so that the realm constructor is um, uh, created as part of creating a realm. So the child, the parent-child relationship would be from, realm to, from a child realm to a parent realm, but not from a child realm to a parent compartment. Uh, and I think that the thing that will determine which answer is right is exactly the issue we were just wrestling with, which is inheritance yes. of host hook behavior. Yep, yep. That's why I was, I was asking this question because I, I believe the compartment relationship should be cross realm. Uh, you create a realm, you try to create a compartment, we need to figure out what is the what, what is the thing that provides the current host operations? And that will be the compartment that, you, that is wrapping the realm. Mark, um, yeah. just an observation. Um, I would suggest a third option, wherein this becomes a configuration uh, determined um, in some way, either by the compartment constructor or the realm constructor. I'm just saying, make, make it configurable as an, as an option. I would rather just pick one or the other. I, I think that yeah. I, 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 configuration I think, is going to be problematic. Yeah, because if you if, nah. because so go ahead, go, go ahead, Karidi. Yeah, if you have a configuration, then uh, is that configuration going to be propagated to new compartments that you create? So if you create three compartments nested, then now, now what? Do I need to provide the same configuration or is it transitive? Okay. That's so, a fair point. Okay, so, so, let, so, so, so I think that's a great open issue. Uh, let's, let's table that, but, but remembering to, that we need to address it. Um, uh, the other thing that the previous discussion uh, points out that is lacking in the API that I'm showing you is the compartment constructor here 
only has two parameters. Uh, and the compartment constructor subsumes the evaluator. It's basically the evaluator plus module handling. Um, uh, uh, and as we just discussed, probably a lot of the hooks that need to be provided to emulate a host. In fact, some of the hooks that need to be provided to emulate a host absolutely need to be provided per evaluator. And therefore those hooks should be um, uh, probably in an options object that's an optional third parameter to the compartment constructor. Yeah, uh, and still, I was, I was about to ask that as well, like what, I, I still fussy on what is the relationship between the compartment and the evaluator? Is the compartment the evaluator or a, an the, abstraction the, on top of it? And so, so, uh, so there's a, let's separate that into specification and shim strategy. Uh, in what we want to specify, uh, there is no separate concept of an evaluator. Uh, there is only the compartment. The compartment, um, uh, uh, an internal discussion to Gorik um, that I haven't yet gotten back to JF about. So, so I'm, I'm partially speaking for JF here, but with some, some things without uh, yet having checked with him. Um, uh, the, this compar the compartment instance object also needs an instance method, which is evaluate. Uh, that that at least takes a string and maybe takes an options object uh, and now uh, the and and now the issue about which options go into the uh, compartment constructor versus which options go into the evaluate method uh, is another thing that is that we'll have to think about on a per options basis. Um, uh, but for many things, I would think that the right place to, to, to have extra options is in the compartment constructor. Um, uh, but since neither one is shown here, let's, let, let me talk about what is shown. So the globals is a object uh, in which the own properties of that object get copied onto the newly constructed global. So when you say new compartment, you get a new global object that is uh, in which the global variables are of that new global object are first of all populated by the normal powerless global variables, which correspond to the uh, nor the specified globals, object, array, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, and then, uh, and, and all of those things come from the shared primordials, which are all powerless. Uh, and, then, and then in addition to those, there's the uh, eval function, the function constructor and the compartment constructor. And then on top of those, are whatever the own properties are of this global object. Um, and go ahead. Are, are you talking about copying onto the global this value or directly onto the global object itself? So in uh, this spec in so in this specification with regard to the the specified behavior of assess machine, uh, the uh, I don't think there can be distinct concepts of global object and global this. Uh, okay. But if there, but but uh, if you have, um, if there's a scenario that would still cause us to distinguish them, um, uh, then we need to face that issue. But I've been assuming that the um, that the global variables, you know, the, the global variable lookup uh, uh, that gets beyond. The global, okay, I should also say, uh, this proposal does not yet say anything whatsoever about the global lexical scope. And I think it does not need to. 
And the reason it does not need to is that there is only two things in the ECMAScript spec that can cause variables to appear in the global lexical scope. And that is a top level let const or class declaration in sloppy code, whether evaluated as script code or as eval code, or a top level let const or class declaration in strict code evaluated as script code. Uh, and none of those cases are possible on an SES machine. An SES machine, the thing that we're specifying here, only supports uh, code running as module code or code running as strict eval code. And uh, for both of those, top level let const or class are contained to that um, uh, source unit, contained to that evaluation. They do not leak into anything global. Um, so uh, this thing does not need a global lexical environment. We can completely dispense with that concept, which is great. Um, uh, and then the other thing that on, the only other case that I know of that causes a need to distinguish, yes. Um, no script code. The um, uh, pixel demo, the instructions at least, uh, involve pasting in a thing that, that runs mainly, it looks like a script to me. So, uh, you know, it's not directly relevant, but we are current. Well, some of our current code uses uh, script stuff. As opposed running uh, because it, the top level let, in, in what way uh, can you see that it's running as script code rather than as eval code? It has multiple lines. I mean, if you have A semicolon B in eval code, what do you get? What do you get as the completion value? Yeah. You get the completion value of B. Wow, I have to check that. That's, how the, that's not my experience. All right. So, okay. a little bit backtracking. Uh, it seems like the only concerns uh, for at least web browser emulation here would be cross frame <coughs> properties are visibly different uh, just because they have some censoring going on. Right. So for dealing with, for, for, so, so this is sort of, um, you know, th so, so this is the same category of question uh, as the one Caridi was asking, which is this spec as specifying CES behavior within the larger JavaScript context uh, has to deal with issues that don't come up strictly in a TC53 context. Uh, so uh, the browser, because of frame navigation, has to deal with the distinction between um, uh, the, uh, you know, what in the, brow what in the browser is called the window versus the window proxy. Uh, in, uh, I think in the, um, in the TC53, as the first concern for this API, we can, for the moment, put that aside. Uh, but obviously, like with Karidi's question about creating new realms, since the purpose of this is also to be part of a, a you know, larger system that includes creating this within a JavaScript system and concerns about host virtualization, we have to face those issues. Okay, so uh, so the global this object you would get copied onto it first the share the, the standard harmless shared frozen primordials, then you would get uh, added to the global this object the uh, 
a valve function function constructor and I'm sorry, uh, yeah, valve function function constructor and compartment constructor. And then you would get the own properties of this globals parameter. And that's obviously just a convenience because you could just add them yourself to the global after you create the compartment. Uh, and so whether it's compelling to make it a parameter or not uh, can be revisited. But right now uh, um, we go ahead and make it a parameter because I think it'll, um, it, it makes it sort of very clear what's going on. It does raise an issue though, uh, which is are we copying the values using get and set or are we copying the descriptors using get on property descriptors and define properties? I can already state from the VM sandbox and node, you should never copy the descriptor over. Really? It is a very bad source of bugs. It is really? extremely bad. I do not do that. Uh, can you say um, uh, can Because you an accessor properties get really wrong. Um, when you copy them over. I could probably dig them up. JS Dom in particular has had many attempts to try to fix that behavior in Node and eventually they just stopped using that copy over behavior. It is, you should not do that. Copying over values seems fine. Copying over descriptors or trying to create a two-way bridge uh, using accessors is not going to be uh, something that helps users. Okay, uh, very interesting. Uh, one of the advantages to simply omitting this as a parameter and just saying, if you want to pre-initialize the global object before you run code in this compartment, uh, you can just do that manually. Is it, that would leave it up to the user code and wouldn't require the API to make a decision on that. Um, uh, the globals, by the way, is uh, inspired by the endowments parameter on the existing uh, moddable API. Uh, and uh, Dan, uh, you're the one who's done the most experimentation with moddable. Um, uh, do you know whether the endowments parameter, whether the values are copied over or whether the descriptors are copied over? Uh, let's see. Um, I did some experimentation, but I forget things like that. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've ever okay. seen the difference. Okay. Uh, so then the interesting thing... But this idea of, of being able to update the global afterward, I have some negative experience with that. Oh, okay. Uh, can, can you go into that? Well, it, it says read-only property. Uh, the instances of compartment have read-only properties. I guess that means you can't replace the global altogether. But I think I've also tried to just, you know, do global dot z equals two and lost. Um, uh, but um, JF put something together that used accessors, did something relevant. Used accessors on the global object? Um, oh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, let me take a look. No. Um, okay, so in any case, um, uh, the, uh, so I think, I think um, uh, uh, the global object itself that we're creating here, uh, we're not freezing it. Um, all the shared primordials are all uh, transitively frozen or harmless, as, as you'd expect. But the, the new global object is, is not frozen by this API. And obviously, the, the, the code constructing the compartment can go ahead and uh, freeze it after construction before it runs code there. Uh, the interesting parameter here is the modules parameter. Um, and the modules parameter uh, is um, the the um, analog of the existing uh, XS uh, um, module map parameter, but it's not creating a module map 
that data structure that can be consulted at runtime by code in the compartment being created. It is only here to map the import namespace of the compartment being created into the namespace of the creating compartment. So uh, this uh, modules argument is, uh, uh, you can think of it as a three-way table or a function from um, uh, two arguments to one argument um, or to one result, or, um, uh, which I'll elaborate on uh, uh, soon to four columns, but uh, it's from refer and specifier uh, to um, uh, parent module name. So the specifier is in the child's namespace. The return result is in the parent's namespace. Uh, and that, uh, that gives you the, um, uh, and then the child can only address those modules that the parent has put into the child namespace. Uh, and the, uh, there is a confusion uh, that, um, that I have, or there, there's, there's something I'm confused about. Let me put it in subjective terms. Uh, I don't know exactly what semantics modable intended, but when I try to figure it out, I get confused if this child parent mapping uh, uh, is intended to give the child access to the same code to be, you know, the same static module to be reinstantiated within the child's compartment uh, or uh, give the child access to the module instance as seen by the parent. Um, uh, the so, at least possible. Okay. Uh, so I think what we need is uh, support for both and a simple way to do that that turned out to um, uh, seem more usable than I expected uh, is to just make it a um, uh, two parameters, in, you know, basically a mapping from refer and specifier to parent module name and a flag, where the flag says, uh, are you referring to the, uh, to the module code in the parent's namespace by this name? Uh, in which case the code gets reinstantiated or gets instantiated in the child compartment, whether or not it had ever been instantiated in the parent. Or are you referring to the whatever instance the parent sees? So it's not necessarily instantiated in the parent, but it's whatever instance the parent sees because the parent itself may have been granted that as wired to some other instance. Um, uh, the uh, Michael mentioned that at the last TC53 meeting that he attended that I did not attend, that he and Peter discussed uh, uh, having the instance passing be by, by having the target of the mapping rather than being a name in the parent be the module namespace object. Uh, and, uh, and that would create, I think, a very, very natural way to express this, which is uh, the module namespace object obviously is specific to some instance and then distinguishing a string from a module namespace object is, is um, an easy way to signal, are you passing, ac are you passing access to code to be reinstantiated 
or are you paying, are you passing access to an instance? So mm -hmm. was there any discussion about lazy instantiation there where a uh, compartment may be given access to a shared instance? So if I make two compartments, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and I want them to refer to the same eventual module namespace, but the parent realm <clears throat> has no intention of instantiating that module itself. Uh, I think it would be difficult for us to achieve that if we use this API as discussed. Okay, um, so, so I'm very glad you brought that up because uh, the question that I'm most urgently want to ask Peter and Patrick is, um, is there any reason for this modules parameter for the XS use case, for the XS implementation? Is there any reason to provide that as an object rather than as a function? Because the more I think of it, the more I, the, the more I don't see why they would prefer an object to a function. And if it's an object, it's still procedurally hookable because you can provide a proxy. So, um, uh, and if it's, uh, and in both cases, for any mapping, it should only be consulted once. It should never be, so if you provide a function, it should never be asked the same question twice uh, uh, because the mechanism, the platform should memoize uh, the answer as long as the question might be needed again. Um, in which case the behavior of the function uh, unambiguously encodes the same graph, uh, the same mapping that an object would encode. Uh, so the next time I talk to them, I'm going to propose that this simply be a function rather than an object, in which case consulting it uh, first on an as needed basis, I think accommodates your concern. Is that correct? Uh, if it is done as needed, yes. Um, I'd like to be on that call if possible. Um, if not, that's fine. Um, there are some potential uh, things you can't do statically. Uh, I don't know if they're trying to do some stuff ahead of time with their preload feature. Because um, I know yep. if we do it um, at runtime on demand with a function, that may cause problems with their preload feature. So um, that seems like something we should discuss. So, uh, so what we have in mind for you know for this thing as a standalone, where there's no uh, where there's no unanticipated module source code, uh, is that the lazy version is still useful, which is it might be that it's uh, when a given uh, import is needed that the compartment creating the instance that you want to provide is only created then. Um, uh, that would make sense even if all the static modules are preloaded. That seems possible. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, so then there's the, um, uh, let me, let me, so let me mention the, the missing method that we talked about in an internal conversation at Agoric yesterday, which is evaluate, which in the absence of, uh, a, an options argument would have exactly the same behavior as, um, the behavior of, um, uh, you know, uh, a compart com or compartment instance dot evaluate of a string should have exactly the same behavior as compartment instance dot global dot eval of the same string. 
uh, for the initial binding of eval. But as uh, Chip pointed out yesterday, eval being a binding on that global that starts out mutable uh, can be replaced. So having a evaluate method on the compartment instance that's aliased to the same behavior, but not subject to manipulation of the global object uh, seems right to me. Um, uh, and it's a natural place to add options if we want, them there, if we want options there. Uh, then the import uh, is uh, uh, essentially the same, the import me instance method on the compartment here uh, is stated, I'm left a little bit confused here, is stated as the same behavior as the dynamic import expression. Uh, and the, so I think what that has to mean is it's the same behavior as the dynamic import expression uh, in the absence of a specifier, I'm sorry, in the absence of a referral, in the absence of a refer. Um, so this isn't adequate as a hook for determining, oh, right, right, it's not intended to be a hook. It's just intended to start module execution within the compartment. Uh, and then the behavior of dynamic import expressions within code executing the compartment is not hooked by this method. It's simply done according to the module map and the specifier uh, provided as argument here is looked up in the, 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 the child's module map. So, so in that sense, it's that that's the sense in which this it's the same as the import expression. It's the same as the import expression for an import expression evaluated uh, uh, in a way that's not sensitive to who the referrer is. Um, uh, and the import expression returns a promise for a module instance object. Uh, this one, it states, returns a promise for a module instance object. And in the TC53, every, all code is preloaded use case. I'm actually not sure if that should be the only form of this. A synchronous form would she, seem possible under that assumption. But let me just make that a tabled question. Uh, and then there's the uh, global, which is an accessor uh, that just gives back the global object for the compartment. Um, and then the cool thing in the rest of this file, which I've uh, you know pasted out of that first link, is uh, JF uh, provides a shim of uh, a subset of what I've just explained um, uh, to the existing XS, you know, SES on XS machine, the actual thing that, that, that uh, the actual um, uh, SES machine that, that Modable has built uh, and the TC53 is using, uh, uh, JF was able to emulate this compartment API using the compartment API that they're providing. Uh, and then he was able to, about that. Uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and so, um, uh, uh, so the one thing that he's not, that I talked through just now that he's not emulating uh, is this ability to distinguish instance versus code. Uh, so whatever the, answer is that uh, the current model, uh, you know, the current modable system provides that confuses me, uh, uh, this shim preserves that confusion. Um, uh, so Dan, is there anything 
Is there any other qualifier that you want to insert on that? The freeway modules map, he's only implemented part of it and it's Oh, right, right, right. He's not, he didn't implement the refer sensitivity. That's correct. Uh, so he's assuming that the referrer, um, that the module map uh, has a, uh, he's only processing the portion of it in which the, the referrer name is specified as asterisk, meaning wildcard, um, which is supposed to match any referrer. Uh, because the current modable compartment behavior does not give us referrer sensitivity, does not give us any ability to do our own mapping from referrer. That's correct. Right. Uh, so, there, so that's two ways in which this differs from what we want. Uh, the absence of referrer sensitivity and the control of code versus instance. The code versus instance thing, if you want to use one module in both ways, that seems like a big change from what Excess does now. Yes. Uh, but Excess, I mean, here, so here's why the Excess thing confuses me, which is um, when you provide the module map in Excess, as I understand it, the normal interpretation of the module map is it's giving access to instances, but when you provide a name as the start module, that that start module name is still dereferenced using the module map, but, but being the start module, it's not the instance that of that module inherited from the parent that is used, it's the code, it's the static module, which is reinstantiated in the new compartment. Well, is this, that, well I'm pretty sure that the, the answer to whether something instantiated again at compartment construction time or not is whether it's in the preload list or not. In other words, the preload list is. Um, I thought I thought the preload list was exhausted. I thought the preload list was exhausted. That it had to be all modules that could exist at runtime had to already be in the preload. No. Wow. Oh 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 the oh oh. List the, is the ones to evaluate at link time. That evaluate at link time. Right, right, right. I'm mixing two, con two different things. There's in the manifest versus in the manifest uh, tagged as preload. Right. Right. Everything has to be anticipated by being in the manifest. Okay, uh, so now I am differently confused. Yeah. But, but I was definitely only paying attention to the distinction between anticipated, i.e. in the manifest, um, and not paying attention to whether it was flagged as preload. And that might be the answer, might be the current answer to everything I'm confused about. And now I have to reevaluate how that relates to the answer I was about to propose. Okay, very good. Um, uh, so, so it might be that if that if if the preload distinction is an adequate way of dealing with the distinction I have in mind, and I don't know that it is. Uh, but if it, if it is, then it might be that JF's shim, by inheriting that answer, has provided an adequate answer that needs to be investigated. Very good. Um, and um, so what he provides in this file is both the shim of the new API in terms of the current behavior 
modulo the refer and modulo uh, this issue. Um, uh, and then what he does is he takes some of the excess examples that use the current excess API and rewrite them in terms of this API to show that this API is at least expressive enough to express their current examples. And, and that's pretty much it. Uh, and I see it's three o'clock. So um, uh, I will take quick questions, but then we should adjourn. Mark, I have Mark, I have one thing I'd like to bring up with you after the recording. Okay. So um, uh, let's see this. Let's see. Stop. Okay. So I'm going to stop recording.